Our New Testament lesson is from Romans chapter 13, and it is our sermon text for today. Paul writes, Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval, for he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be in subjection not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. For because of this, you also pay taxes. For the authorities are ministers of God, attending to this very thing. Pay to all what is owed to them, taxes to whom taxes are owed, revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, and honor to whom honor is owed. Owe no one anything except to love each other, for the love for the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. <clears throat> for the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not commit murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Text for this morning, the words written by a certain man named Paul, who was one of the very first followers of Jesus, who wrote these letters, these words down in a letter that was then read out loud to the Christians in Rome, whom he had never met before, these words of instruction. So I am presently reading a book that's entitled Paul, a biography by the author N.T. Wright, who happens to be an Anglican theologian, and, and Wright makes this compelling case that we are sometimes guilty of reading the radical individualism of our Western culture into Paul's life and into Paul's uh, letter as if Paul's primary concern was simply personal salvation for the sake of going to heaven when I die. Wright then argues that Paul had something much bigger, grander, and greater in mind Namely, that on the road to Damascus, Paul was given a vision by the risen and ascended Jesus of the whole world being put right. That is the kingdom of God arriving into our moment in time by believing that Jesus was in fact the long-awaited fulfillment of all of God's Old Testament promises, but in a striking, shocking, and totally unexpected way, being crucified and then rising from the dead. So before we step into the lesson for today, I need you to take a big step back with me and survey the vast horizon of such a vision, perhaps granted to Paul, which inspired the writing of Romans for our learning, so that through endurance and encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. So I want you to think with me for a moment across all the annals of time, All of the earthly kingdoms, all of the empires that have come and gone. And to see God in the midst of it driving all of fallen human history to a single point. When the time had fully come, God sent forth his son. Paul wrote to the Galatians. 
<laughs> and then from that moment in time, God continuing to drive all human history toward the final consummation, which is the establishment of the new heaven and the new earth when Jesus comes again in glory. Now hold on to that for a minute and listen to how Paul concluded chapter 11. Oh, the depths of the riches and the wisdom and the knowledge of God, how unsearchable his judgments, how inscrutable his ways for from him and through him and to him are all things to him be glory forever. Amen. And then listen as he, as he begins chapter 12 which sets the stage for the rest of this letter, for all the rest of our sermons on out to the end of chapter 16, including our text for today. Chapter 12 begins with these words we looked at a few weeks ago. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies, to present your whole life as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Being a living sacrifice, we learned last week, means that every day of every hour of every moment, including right now, you and I have to deliberately, consciously, and continually, and perpetually offer ourselves to God. That is, take up the cross and follow Jesus. It's constant. It's never over this side of the grave. It is intense. And so we learned last week that if we're going to be that kind of a living sacrifice, if we're going to live that kind of life, it is imperative that we be part of a fellowship of followers worshiping together like this. Yes, indeed, but even more than that, an hour a week, we need also to be engaging in life together around God's Word, talking about our faith with one another so that we can encourage and support and challenge each other as we go out there into the world to overcome evil with good. By not living a typical 21st century tit-for-tat kind of life, trying only to get ahead in the world and make a name for ourselves. In other words, we are kingdom of God, world put right people who are living radically transformed lives that will make people jealous for the love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and faithfulness, and self-control, the fruits of the Spirit that they see in our words, in our attitudes, in our behaviors. That's the big picture. Living such a life is challenging and thrilling. But I beg you, as we step into the lesson for today, to remember the pro pro profound principle that I introduced last week. It's complicated. Look, your sinful, fallen, broken human nature, our natural instinct, seeks to turn us into simpletons who want everything to be easy. But this kind of living is not easy. It's complicated. Now, I want to look at the why and the how of living under civil authority in our relationship to our government. And so the text begins. But before we even get to it, let me, let me confess to you with sincerity a little bit of fear and trepidation. Because this text and trying to figure out what it means for us in 21st century America is the stuff that can sometimes result in riots. This might come as a surprise to some of you. But politics are powerfully divisive. 
<laughs> so I would like to remind you of one of my favorite lines when it comes to discussing politics that you would please always remember that Jesus is not from the right nor is he from the left Jesus happens to be from above so first, the why. Why should we be subject? The word is also translated to submit. And submitting means willingly foregoing your personal wants and needs for the greater good of the larger whole. Why should we be subject to the governing authorities? Well, let's go carefully into the word and let's note, first of all, that all governing authorities of all kinds, of all times, of all places fall under God's authority. Quoting from a Lutheran church, Missouri Synod, which if you don't know, that's our national church body a statement that was issued all the way back in 1968 and some of you may perhaps remember what was happening in our country in that particular moment in time including protest of the vietnam war and the struggle of the civil rights movement the title of this document which you can find online and read it for yourself e email me and i'll give you the link is titled guidelines for crucial issues issues in Christian citizenship. Here's the quote. Civic order is a gift of our sustaining God whose will it is to check and control, now listen, the demonic forces which at all times threaten society with anarchy. And then in parentheses it says, confer Luther's explanation of the fourth petition of the Lord's Prayer, which is give us this day our daily bread as contained in his large catechism. And here's what Luther wrote. This petition is especially directed also against our chief enemy, the devil. For all of his thought and desire is to deprive us all that we have from God or to hinder it. And he is not satisfied to simply obstruct and destroy spiritual government in leading souls astray by his lies and bringing them under his power. But he also prevents and hinders the stability of all government and honorable, peaceable relations on earth. Imagine that. Here is the first point. God is ruling over all earthly governments and working through them to bring his kingdom, which is the world put right, more and more fully into our moment in time by proclaiming Jesus until Jesus comes again to make it permanent. And this the devil absolutely hates. And therefore, he seeks to stir up all kinds of trouble, including disruption of our government, to keep us from living our lives in a way that actually serves God's plan of making all things new through faith in Jesus. But being subject to the authorities doesn't mean that you have to be thrilled and happy about your government and all the things that it does. But this inbreaking of the kingdom of God enables us to be able to look beyond the present moment and trust that God is still up to something that we may not even be aware of or capable of comprehending. So what are you saying, Pastor? Does that mean we simply turn off our brains, lay down, and accept anything that the government does is okay? No. What I am saying is that you have to turn your brains on. It's complicated. You have to engage, but you must always be guided by the bigger plan of God's kingdom coming on earth as it is in heaven in order to know when and how, if necessary, to oppose the government. 
Look, so next comes a section on the practical how of being subject to the governing authorities. So time to go back to confirmation class. Class, what is the fourth commandment? I'll help you. Honor your father and your mother. Martin Luther writes in the small catechism, what does this mean? It means that we should fear and love God so that we do not despise or anger our parents and other authorities, but honor them, serve and obey them, love and cherish them. Now, question number 55 in the explanation of the catechism asks this. How do we fear and love God in keeping the fourth commandment? And then it gives this answer. We fear and love God by not despising our parents, guardians, or other authorities. And then they make it absolutely clear that despising means looking down upon them and making fun of them disobeying or rebelling against their God-given authority. Look, the only time that it is permissible to disobey God-given authority is if that authority commands you to do something that God forbids. And there's another helpful note from the explanation to Lord's Catechism, to the small catechism, where they write, we must distinguish between what a government permits people to do and what it compels them to do. When it compels us to act contrary to God's word, then we must disobey and live as God intends. But when the government permits activities that are contrary to God's word, and I'll let you pick your poison of what the government permits that is contrary to God's word, but when government simply permits such activities, we bear witness by living as God intended. So you remember the authorities commanded Peter and the apostles to stop preaching about Jesus' death and resurrection, to which Peter responded what? We must obey God rather than men. The problem is that our fallen human nature likes to grab hold of that exception and make it the rule. So that we can very conveniently excuse our mocking and laughing and disobeying and rebelling. So can we please acknowledge that some of what we say about our leaders, especially the ones with whom we disagree, our attitudes toward them is in direct conflict with God's word. Look, while we may not fear punishment from the government for our use of free speech, Paul is appealing to your baptized, born-again, new creation in Christ, awakened heart to offer yourself as a living sacrifice by respecting and honoring our leaders even when you do not agree with them. Paul says to do it, quote, for the sake of conscience. Look, your conscience is your redeemed by the blood of Jesus inner voice that tells you what is right and what is wrong. And if my mind has been renewed in view of the mercies of God, and I'm not being conformed to the world that I presently live in, but I'm actually being transformed into the likeness of Christ then I will recognize civil authority as God's authority and I will seek to honor, respect, and obey the government that I find myself living under. So Paul is going to sum up all of this practical how in these verses. First thing I suppose we should note is that Paul actually agrees with Jesus. Render under Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God what is God's. 
And then he challenges us to show a calm, qualified respect for leaders. Look, calm means that we don't get so anxious and so fearful over the actions of our government that do not align with our views of how things should be because God is still ultimately running this world and he promises he will never forget his justice. Vengeance is mine. I will repay. God is the final judge. But this honor and respect is always qualified respect so that we don't fall off the horse on the other side and mindlessly ignore and praise the words, actions, and attitudes of those leaders that we happen to agree with. As one commentator puts it, Christians need to be wary of extreme ideological views on the role of government. On the one hand, it is hard to find biblical support for the view that the government should do nothing but basic law enforcement. On the other hand, the Bible cannot support the view of the government as savior. It's complicated. But Paul is teaching us how to offer ourselves as living sacrifices, not being conformed to the world, but being transformed by God's love for us in Jesus. And now he's going to stretch out beyond the practical to the theological motivation, which is love. And this is not our emotional or romantic love. This is love that intentionally does what is best for others, even when it costs us something to do so. (laughs) This is so much more than just being saved and going to heaven when you die, although it certainly includes that. This is participating in and contributing to the coming of God's kingdom, the world put right into our moment in time. And the only way to achieve this, the the only motivation that is powerful enough to make such living possible is to be continuously looking at God's entire plan for this world recorded in the Bible and believing by the power of the Holy Spirit that it is Jesus' birth, life, death, resurrection, ascension, and promised coming again that is the key that unlocks our courage and our endurance by giving us hope. But forgiveness... For our failures. To live in a right relationship with the government is ours. Again, this morning you heard Pastor Elliot proclaim it. And eternal life in the kingdom of God. The world put right permanently in the new heaven and the new earth. When Jesus comes again is our guaranteed future through faith in Jesus. We love because God first loved us in Jesus. And that love transforms our minds. And it awakens our hearts to engage in this complicated business of being living sacrifices and offering ourselves as such in this fallen and broken world. Here's the weekly awakening question. It's coming, I know. There it is. How does God's authority change the way that you view earthly authority? Can you think about it? Pray about it? Talk about it? Amen. Now the peace that passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in this true faith unto life everlasting. Amen.